My name is Nick Bamington. Uh, I, I grew up in the UK. I started using computers 35 years ago. I've been a technologist uh, for a long time. And in a way, I've been a futurist trying to work out how to take technological systems, integrate them into the world, work out what's happening with culture, and then hacking them into place to see how people react to that and how the world forms around them. You know, culture is the thing that, that's, that's created, and it's, it's ultimately the business model that, that lays on top of the technology that we provide. That, that changes, and this presentation today is, a, is as much about changing um, the business as it is about what I call signals of change, which are technologies that change the world. What we're going to do is I'm going to talk for a while, and then we'll accept some Q&A. And at the end of that, you know, pay, pay attention to what I'm talking about, because we've got a little exercise at the end, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Okay, so are we ready? We're ready. It is a tough crowd, you're right. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm joking. That was actually pretty. That was pretty uh, switched on. Um, so, so I'm the I'm the CEO and lead futurist of an organisation called uh, called Exponential Minds. Um, we work with everyone from the low millions to I think the largest company I dealt with last year uh, manages a fund of 175 billion dollars. Where's the world going? Let's hope that these people know so that that money's safe. I've been working with governments. I've been working with banking, telco, and high tech. Uh, consulting, advertising, education, I'm on TV, radio, and such like. Okay, enough about that. So I'm going to talk about freight and the changes, exponential changes. And when I start to talk about this, I sort of focus on uh, what's been defining momentum and progress and exponential change in our world, and that is industrial revolutions. Obviously, the first industrial revolution happened out in the UK, and we saw a lot of changes there, but it was defined by three dimensions, communications, energy, and transportation. And these are the three things that define the industry that, that you work in, and it defines what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, every presentation I do is specific to an audience. This presentation has not been seen by anyone before. Uh, and the next time I speak to... Um, people that work in a similar field. I'm going to evolve that and change that. Um, but I like to go back to 1900 in New York. You may have seen this picture. Can you see where the car is? There's the car. 13 years later, here's New York. Can you see where the horse is? You can't, because there are no horses. This exemplifies what exponential change does to society and culture. When we actually deliver something that's useful, that changes in terms of transportation and logistics, just like the car did, uh, and, you know, and, and small and light vehicles and whatever, and, and larger haulage that followed after that, we can see huge changes in the world. And now we're at a world where we've seen so much change over the past few years that's defining culturally who we are. So 1900, alongside that, that introduction of the car, is, is electrification. Electri electrification of the world has completely changed everything. Then in 1968, we had a, a guy called Douglas Engelbart out at Stanford University give a presentation called The Mother of All Demos. It was the world's first demonstration of a personal computer. If you go to YouTube, you can find the video of that presentation. In that presentation, he presented the mouse, desktop publishing, keyboard, a, a shorthand keyboard on the side, um, hyperlinking, which is how the internet works these days, and a, an early version of video conferencing. And that was only 50 years ago. A lot of people were naysayers and never believed that anyone would really want to have a computer. But like in the 1990s to today, we've got um, nearly 6 billion people in the world with access to mobile communications. That's more people than have got access to clean running water in the world. So what's, what's more important, right? So people don't always get it right. My presentation isn't necessarily about getting it right. It's more about saying where we are today and where we're likely to end up. But the 2010s has been really defined by a huge change, and that's around artificial intelligence. You've probably all touched systems that use artificial intelligence just this morning, whether it's your email, um, parts of the internet, uh, even parts of this hotel might have optimization relating to artificial intelligence. They say that artificial intelligence is as big a change as electricity came in, in the 1900s, as, as will happen for the next you know, couple of hundred years. It's an exciting time. More is going to change in the next 20 years than it's changed in the last 200. Acceleration is right. That acceleration is what we're going to talk about today. Today, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Those three dimensions are connected to the internet. And they're digitized communications, renewable energy, and digitized automated transportation. And we're going to go down into, into that. But I, I got sent this story a couple of weeks ago by the West Hat team. They said, Nick, this is where 
kind of the industry's thinking. It's 2018. Um, Maersk has become the first container shipping company to introduce its own bo in instant booking confirmation service for customers. Does anyone else think that that's a little behind the times? <laughs> right? But, you know, it's, it's a difficult industry. I'm not going to deny it. As I look into this, it, it's an important, it's a difficult industry, but innovation disruption is fundamentally coming to change the world. To think today that the things that I'm going to talk about aren't likely to happen will be the wrong thing to go away with today. The things that I'm going to talk about today will come, and they will change the world that, that you work in. Uh, and the one thing about change is that it's inevitable, it's uncomfortable, and you either change or change happens to you, or other people change the world around you. And that's where businesses get disrupted. So... We know that the logistics industry is, is huge. By 2023, they think it's going to be about $15.5 trillion. This is, this is incredible. You know, 92.1 billion tons of goods being handled, and we can just expect that to grow and grow and grow. We're in a connected world. We want to be part of that solution. So as I alluded to, I'm going to talk about something called signals of change. The signals of change are the things that I see when I walk on the street and I drive around, I, I fly from here to there, I go to different countries, and I, I look at the research and development happening in laboratories, and I look at the changes that are happening in some of the larger tech companies and some of those signals that are saying, the world is changing, billions of dollars are being invested in this area, and that change is inevitable. It might not always work, but it's definitely inevitable. Every single presentation I talk about, I kind of start off by talking about energy. I'm the most excited about how the energy revolution's coming. Uh, I think that we're in a, a very critical point in, in the Earth's history. I think that climate change is real. Um, the, the people that still deny that climate change is caused by CO2 emissions, I, I just struggle um, with, with those people. Um, they're wrong. Um, and that, that happens at the very high political levels as well as on the streets as well. Um, we're at crisis. We have to change. We have to move away from fossil fuels. In fact, some people are saying that that's going to be so drastic that by 2030, we're going to be at about $10 a, for, a bar for a barrel of oil. And the, the, the use of oil and, 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 and fossil fuels burning to actually transport things around the world and transport humans is, is fundamentally going to change. Now, this is hard for some people to really wrap their heads around. I mean, we live in Canada. We're a country that's been made rich by, by oil out of Alberta. It's, I was in Alberta last week, and what was really interesting was two years ago, I, I would show this, and I would literally have people run up to me on the stage and throw me um, leaflets about the oil sands and say, look at the innovation we're doing here. We'll be fine. And the conversation I had last week was everyone's open to renewable energy and they understand that the change is coming. That's exponential change in the mindset, which is really, really heartening to see. Um, this is a company in China. Um, this is real. This is not Photoshop. This is Green Panda. It's a company in China that build 300 plus acreages of uh, solar farms. Um, we talked a little bit about China today, and, and China's leading the way with renewable energy in the world. And actually, we're installing about 70,000 solar cells per hour. Not per week, not per month, per hour. The change is coming. Most of that change is happening in China. They're doing most of the innovation. We're going to have to buy most of that technology going forward from China unless we step our game up. Uh, but what, it, what, if it doesn't, uh, what if it isn't sunny all the time? Somewhere like Alberta has over 300 days of sunshine a year. It's great to see a lot of solar projects and subsidies are kicking in over there. Um, but the, 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 the smart people in Finland have come up with this uh, new black silicon solar cell that uses nanotechnology to harvest the same amount of energy from the light even on cloudy and rainy days, which is what we need here in British Columbia, right? So that change is coming. These guys are also very, very smart, and, and they were inspired by the big skyscrapers and the cities that they're surrounded by. And they thought, what if every single pane of glass could become a solar energy cell? So what they've done, they're from the um, University of Michigan and MIT. Um, they put together, this was about two years ago, uh, the first prototypes of, of solar glass. This is now going into production. It can be rolled out. If this, if this is rolled out on scale, somewhere like One World Trade Center in New York City uh, will generate the same amount of electricity that's needed for 350,000 homes. Can you imagine? We, sit, we live in the city of glass here. So imagine even if half of those windows in Vancouver uh, were actually covered um, with this kind of technology, 
we're kind of energy independent as a city. This is very compelling. And then, but what about batteries, um, lithium ion batteries, and the such like? Well, Elon Musk and uh, uh, a great Australian entrepreneur uh, called uh, uh, Max Ken uh, Mike Cannon Brooks were, were, were sort of talking online and talking about the problems in Aus southern Australia, southwest Australia. Sorry. So they built this. Uh, they built this battery farm. Uh, Tesla did within a hundred days. And if they, if they would have exceeded that, Elon Musk would have given it to them for free. It wasn't cheap. It was about 90.6 million Australian dollars. But in the first six months of operation, it's already, it's already made $13.1 million by putting energy back into the grid. That seems like good business to me. right? So energy, renewable energy, battery technology, these are the things that will define the new world that we're headed to, into. But what's really interesting about the energy revolution is this idea. The idea that we could potentially have smart grid technology that, that runs from country to country and shares uh, abundant renewable energy. And we live in a world where energy, the price is almost zero. Um, and it's abundant. And we can, we're not reliant on, on necessarily on utilities for all of our electricity anymore. Now, this is a long, long way out. When, when I look at this as a futurist, I sort of question, it's like, well, you don't just flick a switch. Everyone sort of shakes hands and then puts in the infrastructure. But it's coming. They're, they're already building some of the prototypes of this uh, in, in Asia. The Asian supergrid's going to be five countries. I was chatting to a good, good friend of mine that's actually seen the relay between China and, and, uh, and Russia. So it's coming. It's coming slowly, but you know, it, it's going to get there. OK, energy. The second one I'm going to talk about is electric vehicles. Does anyone own an electric vehicle in the room? No one? Does anyone want to buy an electric vehicle? Yeah, everyone. See, this is, that's really interesting. I bought my electric vehicle earlier this year. My electric vehicle is Ziggy. It's a Chevrolet Bolt. Uh, it's the second one on the left here. And uh, you know, since uh, July, uh, I've spent no money on fuel, and I've driven 3,000 kilometers. I just plug it in wherever I go. It's, it's free to charge in many places around Vancouver. You know, I may have paid like three or four dollars, I think, to, for some of the pay parking spots that actually use uh, um, electric vehicle charging as well. This is a picture I took two weeks ago in Pacific Center. So here we've got an Audi, a Chevrolet, a BMW, and a Kia. They're all electric or they're hybrid electric vehicles. And, and the amount of change in that industry is incredible. In, in British Columbia alone, in the last quarter, electric vehicle sales have jumped 300%, mostly because of Tesla. And the amount of electric vehicles that I see on the road now is incredible. Uh, but over, over time, you know, electric vehicles, it's not going to be that quick to be adopted. They still cost a lot of money. Car companies aren't really promoting them. For me to go and test drive my car before I actually bought it, I had to go and speak to a friend of mine that had one and test drive his. Chevrolet have got one vehicle, one Chevrolet Bolt in the whole of Metro Vancouver that you can test drive. So this is where the business model is saying, we're still going to sell combustion engine vehicles. Stops electric vehicle is being adopted. In the next three to five years, you're going to see a lot of that changing. Um, some of the changes that I'm seeing um, that are actually going to free us and free our minds into the idea of buying electric vehicles is this. This is a company down in California. It's called ITAP. They took an old BMW. They refurbished it for 13,000 US dollars. Uh, they used 90% 90, 90 recycled parts, including all the batteries. And in one single, uh, well, in two, two days, uh, and they rested overnight, they drove 1,204 kilometers. It was something that Elon Musk was talking about, hitting that 1,000 kilometer range. My car's about 400. 100 kilometers if I'm driving safely. It's about 350 if I drive normally. And it's about 300 if I just drive like a maniac. Um, but what's really interesting about this, they actually drove it to Tesla twice to show Elon Musk. He didn't come and see it. It was $13,000 to build this car. Admittedly, most of that car is batteries. Right? But it's, it's interesting to see that that's where we're getting to. There's no such thing as range anxiety in 2018. That's the thing, thing of the past. Now, obviously, we work in haulage, and we, we work with vehicles that need to go further than the average um, you know, commuter or, or even long-range driver. So there's some questions around that, especially for your industry. Um, but what's really interesting was a piece of research I read last week. Morgan Stanley says that four out of every five cars will be battery electric by 2050. The change is coming, right? 
45% of all new vehicles in, in Norway are actually sold uh, electric. They've got really good incentives. It's cheaper to buy a Tesla Model S than it is to buy a BMW M3 in, in Norway. Um, $90 billion is being pumped into the automotive industry to actually look at electric vehicle technology. And all of, the, all of the companies that are building this in autonomous vehicle technology are now in Silicon Valley. Right? Uh, it, it's interesting to me. When I see these things, these are direct indicators that um, industries are aligning in new ways. And I can tell you that people like Google uh, and Alphabet, their parent company, people like Facebook and Apple and whatever, they don't want combustion engine vehicles. They don't even want you to drive vehicles. This, these are the new... Car companies. Does anyone own a, a Dyson vacuum cleaner in the room? Yeah? Would you buy a Dyson electric vehicle? Well, they're, well, they're pumping about $2 billion into that idea right now. Uh, would you bet against James Dyson? I wouldn't. Great English inventor. Would you bet against Elon Musk? Like, you know, even, even though he seems to be a little wayward uh, most recently, I always say, here's a million dollars, bet against Elon Musk. I, don't, I haven't found anyone that would say, yeah, absolutely, I'd bet against him. And, and there's a number of reasons why you wouldn't. Because he, he's a wild thinker that is changing the world. One of his uh, big, big releases of the past year was the, the Tesla Semi. Uh, it, it's claiming to have a haulage of, I, I think it's around uh, 60,000 pounds. So that, that's pretty good. There's some questions about how much of that 60,000 pounds is battery. right? So um, th th there's lots of questions here. What's going to change? Well, a lot of people have already got pre-orders, including Walmart, for this kind of technology. Volvo is actually now working on concept trucks that, that use different kinds of renewable energy and, and, and different kinds of, of clean burning fuel. Uh, and you've even got uh, locomotives going down the route of being fully electric now. Now, there's been electric locomotives over the years, but this is an electric uh, locomotive that's got a huge amount of range. I think it's about 400 kilometer range just on its own. And then down in India, more, more of the commuter trains are kicking in with Al Alstom. So as I look around, I see the electrification of the world happening. Again, go to Norway. There's a fully electric car ferry. I was in the Isle of Skye. Uh, I took a hybrid electric diesel ferry. It's brand new, about two, three years old, uh, from Skonsa to, to, to Raze, just across the little strait there. It was amazing. It was very quiet on the way over. On the way back, they'd obviously um, used up all the electric in their reserves. But this, this kind of technology is coming to shipping. Um, in fact, if you look at container shipping, this is in China. This is, a, this is a, a large container ship that runs up and down the Yangtze. It's only got about a 40 mile range today. Ironically, it takes coal up the Yangtze. <laughs> you can't make this up, seriously. But we know that batteries are getting cheaper. We know that the technology is getting better. What's really fascinating about China is how much they're leaning into the whole electric vehicle uh, world. Um, we're seeing huge growth over there, 20% um, year-on-year growth in, in people actually buying uh, electric vehicles. And, and it, it, it's incredible to me. Nine and a half thousand buses, electric buses, are deployed every five weeks in China. That's the same size as the, the, the bus fleet in London in the UK. So, you know, when China says, let's do it, they do it. Right? And it's from the top down. But again, it came back to me. It's like when we're looking at like heavy transport planes, heavy plant equipment, those things, is it really, are the changes coming to, to that industry, the industry that, that we all work in that quickly? Well, the fuel that we burn doesn't necessarily have to be dragged out of the ground. This is a company up in Squamish. And these people have had a huge amount of attention in the last three months. Uh, Vice featured them in a documentary. I've got a, a, my good friend John works there. Uh, it's a company called Carbon Engineering. And Carbon Engineering out of Squamish, they take CO2 from the air and turn it into clean burning fuel. That's the equivalent of any of the fuels that you use in your vehicles today. So imagine if we could do that on scale. Not only can we take CO2 out of the environment, we can turn it into something that, that's usable and safe. And they've just, in the last 10 years, been able to get this to, to a scale and a cost of production that's actually applicable to industry. So this, I think, carbon engineering is, is the next multi, multi-billion dollar Canadian company. Right? Imagine if you can have this kind of technology 
anywhere from, from the ports that you operate in to actually being you know, in a smaller scale eventually on, on ships that you operate with, with diesel, that are hybrid diesel, electric, and whatever. That, that's the promise, that you can actually have a more um, circular economy around the, the emissions and the fuel that we actually burn. And the world gets better over time. OK, so we, we've, we've looked at how the world's uh, changing in terms of electricity, electrification, electric vehicles, and then into self-driving. Uh, and self-driving sort of starts with, with the idea that data is the foundational element of the world that we live in. Uh, in fact, we'll be generating about 163 zettabytes of, of data by 2025. That's the equivalent of a billion billion high-definition movies. The most valuable companies in the world uh, have got data as their foundation. The most valuable companies in the world, I'm guessing, still I haven't checked the stock market today, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook. They're worth about $4.5 trillion. They're the fifth largest country in the world if they combine forces and only 900,000 people. My friend actually just started at Google yesterday. He said that 250 people started on the same day as him. Right? These are the companies that are growing. These are the companies that are redefining our world. But, but when we look at data, we have to understand where we are. Is there's data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. We are operating in what I'm calling the wisdom economy. We use the smarts that we've generated over the years, the experience that we have to define who we are as humans and how businesses work. But we're starting to corral towards a world where the data and information and knowledge is being automated and those insights are coming to us quicker. You know, I mean, if you think about the data level, layer, data information, how many people build spreadsheets, right? How many people love spreadsheets? There's always one or two, right? But <laughs> there's a, me, I love spreadsheets. Yeah, you won't have to deal with them anymore in the future. That, that's a future that I, I think I'm going to enjoy. Okay. I was a management consultant for years, so I lived in spreadsheets for far too long. I'm, I'm still recovering. Okay, artificial intelligence is, is also the thing that works directly with big data that, that there is in the world to try and process that, to try and see the patterns and predict behaviors and to optimize how we, how we learn and how we interact. Um, over the years, artificial intelligence has got stronger. In 1997, uh, Gary Kasparov got thrashed by IBM's uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, that, that was a game of chess. It's relatively simple. 2011, IBM Watson's won, won the game of Jeopardy, won a million dollars. Uh, and just last year, we, we saw a couple of different things. Uh, Lee C. Dole, the ninth down world champion of Go, was beaten four games to one by AlphaGo. This game is, the, the game of Go is incredibly complicated. So the people at Google, AlphaGo, they pointed at all the games that had been played, then it played itself, and then it played this guy. And what was fascinating was it played intuitively and beautifully like a human. In fact, Lee C. Dole learned new ways of playing Go from artificial intelligent computer that worked out new things, uh, new ways and new strategies of operating within a game, game structure that he'd never thought of before. And now he's learned from that and he's got even stronger. Then they, they developed AlphaZero, which was based on that platform. It learned chess in four hours, became completely unbeatable, and it taught itself the game of Go without looking at any of the history of the game of Go and just the rule set in 40 days and became completely unbeatable. So this evolution is showing us that artificial intelligence in a very narrow setting is incredibly powerful. It is better than humans. If something's logistical, it's got a rule set, and you've got data behind it, artificial intelligence will change how the world works in that particular area. And to that effect, by 2030, it's going to have a huge effect on, the, on GDP worldwide, about $15.7 trillion. Now, all of this research is in the presentation. I'm going to share the presentation with you. There are links at the bottom of each of these pages. You can go digging to see if you believe these numbers. But I've done lots of research, and I, I, I truly believe that these are indicators of how the world is changing. But a lot of people didn't believe that autonomous vehicles were going to be part of the future. Chrysler didn't. Hands-free driving. Cars that park themselves. An unmanned car driven by a search engine company. We've seen that movie. It ends with robots harvesting our bodies for energy. This is the all-new 2011 Dodge Charger. <laughs> okay, um, so this is one of, one of Waymo's vehicles. This is run by Google, this company, uh, and that's a Chrysler. They buy their cars from Chrysler. Chrysler doesn't provide any of the technology beyond um, this, you know, the car itself. 
Okay? And Waymo's valued at $175 billion today, and Chrysler's market cap is $25 billion. So 2011, you know, let's sell a few more Dodge Chargers because robots are going to harvest us for energy. Not true. And the search engine company is going to completely dominate, certainly, not, not, certainly North America. Waymo will completely dominate North America in terms of autonomous driving fleets, um, you know, cabs and such like. And even the Department of Transportation down in the US believe that by about 2023, 2024, the amount of vehicles sold will start to decline, personal vehicles, and the amount of vehicles that people subscribe to through applications and use that are autonomous will start to rise exponentially. <coughs> This is government preparing for the future. These people, you know, they're not always right. The Department of uh, Transportation down in the States really gets things wrong, mostly about, you know, the adoption of renewable energy. I'm kind of hoping that they're right with this. But we've already seen, like, trucking um, being very successful. This isn't electric truck. Um, this is still using an this is still using a internal combustion engine. But th this is a truck uh, run by a company called Embark, and it drove from San Diego to Florida. Um, with only two interactions from the onboard engineer, and they were very slight interactions. You still can't have them just on their own right now. But what's that world going to look like? You know, Volvo's working on the idea of a fully autonomous vehicle, no, no cab, uh, and someone remotely would sort of monitor that, and the artificial intelligence on board would make sure it would get from A to B. Mercedes-Benz is looking, for, looking at Urbanetic and looking at a, a system where you could interchange from, from like light haulage to personal vehicle to, to whatever. I find that to be a really interesting idea. You can't really call it a car anymore if it doesn't have a steering wheel, I don't think. This is really interesting. I was just reading about this. It's a company called Ike from the States. And they believe that actually autonomous, autonomous trucking will, will have a configuration at the beginning where you'll have literally ports... Not, not, not seaports, but you know, ports or, or terminals on highways where autonomous vehicles would be driven um, to and from through cities by humans working with the artificial intelligence, but it would just go on highways fully autonomously. It's a different kind of business model. It's a very smart way of dealing with some very complex problems. We know it's difficult to drive large haulage through cities. Um, there's platooning, and we've seen this idea. You're probably aware of, of, of this notion. But imagine a world where you've got platooning and fully autonomous vehicle routes. And, and we're even trialing some of that in the next year or two um, in, in Greater Vancouver, Metro Vancouver. So, so we're going to start to see this. It's really interesting. The, the availability of driving um, is going to be driven up. Autonomous lorries will be able to drive 78% of the time from 2030 onwards uh, versus 29% of the time right now. We know the rules and regulations about drivers stopping yeah, and not driving for too long or working for too long. All of those rules get thrown out the window. The, the, the costs are going to be coming down as well, and this is taken from research. You know, driving down, um, reducing those logistic costs by about 47% by 2030. So we're sitting in a world where there's greater availability, better growth of an economy. We'll be able to get things in and out of Manitoba super easy at that point. And we'll actually see that that, that cost actually goes down, which means that we can invest more in the infrastructure to, to let us do this. And we're actually seeing autonomous locomotives happen. I mean, the SkyTrain here is pretty much autonomous. It's just got a control center. Rail is super interesting. And when I was looking at some of the, the research, like actually, you know, that rolling stock, having any delays there costs a lot of money. For every one, one mile per hour rise in velocity, the industry gains $2.5 billion in value. So you can see that people are investing in this area, and that change is coming. For every 1% improvement in rail car terminal dwell, they save $2.2 billion. So making it run on time, um, whether it's in port, out on the rails, um, outside of port, or wherever, and, and ensuring that that's utilized and optimized in, in, in the best way possible is the way that the industry is going to be defined in terms of profits. And I sat down with the team about, about a month and a half ago. I took them through the presentation. I'm like, let's get into ports a little bit more. Let's look into that. And it's been absolutely fascinating to me to, to, to really delve into this. Um, I've got a couple of videos as part of this because there are some people with some really, really smart ideas. And people are trying to imagine the future. And these, these are people that are you know, traditionally providing services and providing vehicles and logistics to the industry.
Your order will be shipped within minutes. The smart container knows its contents and destination. Every move it makes will be fully automated. This is Kalmar, by the way. It will automatically join other containers bound for the same destination. Terminals will be complete logistic ecosystems, acting as global interchange points for an on-demand society. As everything is connected, we will be able to predict exactly when goods will arrive. Everything will run smoothly as predictive maintenance is continually performed on all equipment to avoid downtime. Artificial intelligence is combined with human experience and knowledge to solve more complex problems. Parts will be printed on site when needed. Efficient and seamless operations are critical. When cargo arrives at the quayside, it is unloaded immediately and delivered to its destination. It seems a bit too clean, really, doesn't it? In 2060, we will be more connected than ever. We will live in a smart, global ecosystem that will bring us closer together. I, I love these sorts of, um, you, these are like what we call speculative futures. I would have just gone down the shop and bought some coffee, right? <laughs> uh, but, but it's an idea. Hyperloop doesn't really work that way that they said in that. And then, but these big, grandiose ideas, the, these, these, this drawing of, of scientific futures and speculative futures is something I do and, and the company that, that I run does a lot of. But, but this is to try and inspire us because if we can work out where we might go, we can work out some of the steps that we can start taking in the next three to five years to get us part way there. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, this is actually a real picture um, from, from a port... I think it's in Dubai, maybe not Dubai, maybe, maybe it's, it's definitely somewhere out, in the, um, out in, in, in the Emirates or somewhere like that. And, and you've, you've got someone that, that's actually got a centralized control o over a bunch of automated cranes. Um, this world is getting super interesting. Kalmar, again, the same company that made that, and, and uh, Terberg and whoever, they're, they're actually building autonomous... Um, capabilities for ports. I think that that vision, that grandiose vision of the future is going to start to be delivered in small parts and make our lives a lot better and optimization and, and operational efficiency is going to kick into the ports that we have. And, and then there's ideas around, you know, drones and delivery and, and how that really starts to lubricate, you know, smaller package delivery. They're doing something super interesting in Iceland that I just want to share. Yeah, it's, it, it's surprising. I was in I was in Iceland uh, in a, around Reykjavik uh, in the summer. 
It takes a long time to get from A to B in that city. It's funny. Um, so we've got that. But then what about heavy-duty drones? Well, some engineers out in Russia, it's not an electric drone, uh, but it's got a 400-pound uh, payload uh, ability. Uh, the drones that are happening for larger haulage could have some real potential in the industry. Since 2017, Skiv drones have performed multiple flight tests in various conditions, including harsh winter weather with wind gusts up to 20 km per hour and temperatures below 20 degrees Celsius. The team is now working to increase the lifting power of the primary engine. The new model with new propellers and a more powerful engine is going into flight tests in summer 2018. Skiv is pioneering the global market of industrial-grade autonomous drones. Skiv's flexible design allows for creating different modifications for diverse applications, such as unmanned logistics in remote areas, smart crop dusting in agriculture, firefighting at high-rise buildings, and numerous other applications one can't even imagine today. Yeah, so, so that's really interesting to me as well, the idea of drones um, being part of our ecosystem uh, going forward. I, I think it's, it's, it's inevitable. I do think that things like Skiff will become electric as well. And, and again, I've got another video that I want to show you, and it's a little longer this time. And uh, Rolls-Royce uh, are starting to develop and build this autonomous ship. There's some really interesting stats around autonomous ships as well, the reduction in pi you know, piracy and, and, and the such like, um, that I'm not going to share here, but I've got some reports that I could share. Um, but Rolls-Royce, again, have got this very grandiose idea about what that world could look like. I actually think the video that I'm just about to show you is, is literally only about five to ten years away. We live in an ever-changing world where unmanned and remote-controlled vessels are becoming reality. Let us share a view of this world with you. The control room is the nerve center of remote operations in the Rolls-Royce OX concept, where the global wall shows a real-time overview of worldwide shipping traffic. A full situation overview is presented to operators who are monitoring vessels via remote link from their onshore workstations. Dynamic positioning reports DGPS-1. Lost connection for vessel RR-9835. Suggested course of action. Diagnostics. Commands? Proceed. GPS, Geopositioning and Celestial Navigation Status, Nominal, INS Status, Transmission Stopped, Suggested Failure Mode, Physical, Commands? Stand by. I'll have a closer look. Drones 01 through 08, ready for inspection flight. Commands? Launch Drones 1 and 2, Flight Plan, Standard Inspection Routine. Camera control, manual with eye track. Deploy replacement for selected antenna. Schedule post-mortem inspection and change of antenna at next port of stop. Add checkpoint for operator at selected time. Verify navigation data integrity. The vessel is ready for handover to local operator at West Coast BTS. Transferring administrative documents. Suggested course of action, break and refreshment. Okay. Leave the documents open when they're ready. Confirmed. The OX local wall presents a place where vessels and traffic in the local zone are tracked and controlled, and their port operations are scheduled, controlled, and managed. Vessel RR9835, pending transfer to local VTS. 
administrative documents ready for review and approval. Okay, I, I show, it's a little long. I mean, it's about 15 minutes long. This is like a film. It's amazing. Like, uh, honestly, if I could show it to, all to you now, but like I'm being paid to speak and give you my insights, it's a bit of a bit of a scam if I do that. But it's amazing to me that there are some of these big ideas and some of these companies are trying to redefine what this future is going to look like. I, I, I love this video because I think that there's a lot of reality to it. I don't think it's that far away. I don't think the Hyperloop's that far away. You know, I think we're going to see some of this happen in Eastern Europe and even down the Western seaboard, uh, maybe across the Eastern seaboard. Uh, the, the trouble is, in, in places like Canada, things like Hyperloop um, still have the same struggles as pipelines. You still need to build huge pipes across the country, right? <laughs> um, this, this, this actually won't, uh, won't, won't break and pour oil all over the country, though, so that's, that's something else. Discuss. But where's the new frontier? Where, where are we going to be going with, with, with the, the future of, of freight and haulage? I was on stage with uh, Commander Chris Hadfield earlier this year. I was, I was actually speaking just before him. It was nerve-wracking. He's like a legend, right? And he put this video up, and I said, oh, I need to put that in some presentations, because he said, this is the new normal. Did anyone watch this live? Yeah? The first, time, the first time I saw one of these rockets land, it was a video and, and, and everyone was running out. I cried. It was one of those absolute defining moments of the future of the world and how we operate that you don't see that often in such a large way. Again, here's a million dollars bet against Elon Musk, would you? I wouldn't. SpaceX is doing amazing things. They now do more launches uh, at a much more reduced cost than, than ever before. And now they're actually talking about going to Mars uh, and, and doing larger BFR, I think his rocket's called. Uh, big flipping rocket, I think. Yeah? But there's an idea with this that can actually go from, from place to place on Earth. So, so some people are speculating that you can actually fly from, say, just outside of London to just outside of Tokyo in about 45 minutes using this kind of transportation because they're rockets that can take off and land themselves. Will it be expensive at the beginning? Yes. Will it get cheaper? Absolutely. That's, ha that's what we see in history. You know, we will get to the future where we're doing interplanetary freight. I'm not really going to dwell on that point now, right? Um, if, if you go down to Silicon Valley, it's amazing how many people are working in this kind of area. In fact, there was a blockchain company that, that bought um, interplant, in, in, what was it, planetary resources, which are trying to mine um, asteroids. Will that happen? Yeah, it's probably about 20 or 30 years away, but it's absolutely going to happen because there's a huge amount of resources out there. But there's a warning, all of this. All this technology is great, connection, data, systems, um, but there's cybersecurity to consider. If you're asking yourself, a, uh, actually, here's a question. Ask yourself this question. Am I adequately covered for cybersecurity in your operations? If there's any doubt, go back to your office and start the conversation about making sure that you are secure. Because actually, a company's hit every 40 seconds um, by ransomware. Um, that global ransomware damage was about $5 billion in 2017. I was attacked in March. Someone tried to hijack my website with about 14,000 uh, penetration attempts overnight. It was very stressful for about two hours. Um, they didn't get in because I'm... I've got a very um, smart group of people that I work with. But um, one in five businesses in Canada have been attacked. Um, the BART down in San Francisco was, was hijacked and held ransom. Luckily, they could bring it down, uh, fix all the problems, and bring it back up. Uh, funnily enough, the hacker that did this uh, was found by all the hackers there are in San Francisco, and they took all his Bitcoin. Um, that, but that's a good news story. Mesk coming up again in this, they got attacked with, with NotPetya, and they think that they lost about $300 million in revenue because of the computer issues that this, this particular software caused. And, this, and NotPetya was caused because the people in IT did not update their systems adequately with patches. It wasn't even something that, that, that should have happened to businesses if they'd stay, stayed on top of the software that they deployed in their organization. And this is going to continue. 
But where are we going to go in the future? You know, I've, I've kind of alluded to it, and yes, there's some videos uh, painting some, some pretty big speculative futures, and some are closer than others. But the one thing that we, we do, and this is Amara's law, is that we overestimate the impact of technology in the short term. So there's a lot of things, and I've made lots of grandiose statements, and this is coming, and that's coming, and whatever. That's fine. It's a, maybe a little bit of overestimation, but in the long term, we completely underestimate the impact. We completely underestimated the impact of computers, mobile phones. We, we're completely underestimating the impact of things like electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and artificial intelligence today. I've made some, made some little predictions where we're going to be in 2025. I think the self-driving taxis, transit, and trucks become commonplace. Um, electric vehicles start to take over shorter trucking routes um, that are less than 1,000 kilometers, and the, the batteries on board will, and the technology will be able to operate in those boundaries. Ports will be investing more heavily in automation and big data analytics to run more cheaply and to ensure efficiency. I think they'll also start to invest a lot more in cybersecurity. Where are we going to be in 2030? It gets really difficult. I, I mean, the level of certainty um, sort of drops e even in that short five-year period. I actually think that electric trucks can drive about 1,500 kilometers on a single charge as standard. Electric and hybrid shipping is prevalent. Clean burning fuel will be used um, where engines need to be operated. Human-driven trucks are outlawed on highways and autonomous uh, Trucks are actively controlled within city limits by skilled supervisors. Um, the the human-driven trucks outlaw was actually taken from a former chief executive of GM and what he thinks the world is going to be like. Um, all major global ports are autonomous, supported by a small technical crew, and suborbital uh, transportation ports start to gain popularity. So yes, we will put things in a rocket and send them from A to B. For, for critical infrastructure and technologies, that's going to be pretty standard stuff. But what about 2050? When I start to look out that far, I like to tell stories. And the stories that I tell need to, need to be a bit provocative. So that's exactly what we have here. So here's my vision for Vancouver 2050. An electric solar ship arrives from Hong Kong into Vancouver. It connects to the port that guides it to its dock at the scheduled time and overseen by the control team who are located in a logistics control center in Nevada. While the ship is connected for rapid charging of their batteries and clean burning backup fuel is pumped, the cranes unload the cargo and and load the majority onto trains for cross-country shipping, while other specific containers are loaded onto trucks that platoon out of the port onto dedicated lanes. Meanwhile, Cargo has been scheduled for loading, and the ship leaves its dock for a harbor charging station before heading on its way back to Hong Kong. Everything is done to the split second using sensors, cameras, and autonomous systems that are controlled by artificial intelligence with the oversight of a small expert team in Nevada. The control room operations are connected to all other, like land, sea, air, freight operations, and municipalities where key communications are sent, payments made, and small adjustments in scheduling are made in microseconds and accessible by all. And I think the port is going to be operated by Amazon. So, <laughs> would you bet against Amazon? I, I think the two trillion is the, the new one trillion. I think, it's, uh, I think we're headed into a very strange world. This is provocative. How likely is it that Amazon's going to run those ports worldwide? I can guarantee that people like Amazon, Alphabet, and, and, and those companies are going to have the money to be able to operate their own ports. Amazon's already trying to, to operate and control its own uh, supply chain. And this, this comes to the point where we're going to open up for, for some Q&A, but, but remember this. And this is a quote from Grace Hopper. She's uh, one of the early computer pioneers. She, she built the first assemblers. In fact, some of the greatest computer programmers in the world and the people that pioneered the industry were women. Humans are allergic to change. They love to say, we've always done it this way. I try to fight that. That's why I have a clock on my wall that runs counterclockwise. And I think it's interesting. Change is inevitable. We either change or change happens to us. Thank you very much.